Okay, so today we're diving into some really interesting stuff. stuff. It's uh, we've got these articles. Mm -hmm. One of them is called 40 Failed Predictions of Evolution." Right. It's, it's gonna be a wild ride because the other one is called "Moving the Goalposts." <laughs> it's like they're challenging the very foundation of how we understand the universe and life on Earth. Yeah, and before we jump in, we want to be clear: we're not here to tell you what to believe. Exactly. This isn't about proving or disproving evolution. We just want to lay out the arguments. Present the evidence and let you come to your own conclusion. Even if you disagree with the article's conclusions, wrestling with these ideas can strengthen your own understanding. Absolutely. Sometimes the vessel falters, crumbling in his hands. But the potter never gives up. He has a perfect plan. He reshapes the broken pieces with patience and with skill. And what was once discarded now reflects his perfect will. On the poles we were spinning round and round and round through the fire and the pressure until we're heaven bound. Every crack and every flaw he'll mend with tender care. For the potter's hands are faithful and his love is always there. So let's start with one of these failed predictions. And we're talking about something straight out of a sci-fi movie, the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR for short. Ah, yes, the faint afterglow of the Big Bang. Exactly. Now, the standard Big Bang model predicted that the CMBR would be kind of lumpy. Like a choppy sea with peaks and troughs representing areas of different density in the early universe. But here's the thing. When scientists actually measured the CMBR, it was incredibly smooth. Smoother than a baby's bottom. Yeah. And that posed a bit of a problem. It did. Because that smoothness suggested that matter was distributed much more evenly in the early universe, which makes it hard to explain how stars and galaxies formed. It's like trying to make a cake with batter that's too thin that just won't hold its shape. Perfect analogy. So to explain the smoothness problem, cosmologists came up with this idea called inflation. Inflation. Yeah, basically it says that in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe expanded incredibly rapidly, like way faster than the speed of light. Faster than the speed of light. That's mind boggling. I know, right? But that rapid expansion would have smoothed out any initial lumpiness. So it's like ironing out the wrinkles in the fabric of space time. You got it. Now inflation is a clever solution. It is. But it also introduced after the smooth CMBR was observed. Hmm. Which leads to the rescuing device argument presented in Moving the Goalposts. They argue that inflation was a way to rescue the Big Bang model from potentially contradictory evidence. So it's like saying, okay, we didn't expect the universe to be this smooth, but we can explain it away with this new idea. And the article argues that this pattern of introducing new explanations after the fact isn't unique to cosmology. Right. They claim it pops up in other areas of science where evolutionary theory is applied. It makes you wonder, are we really following the evidence wherever it leads? Or are we just trying to fit the evidence into our existing theories? It's a question worth pondering, I think. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole universe of failed predictions to explore. Exactly. But we'll save those for later in the deep dive. From the vastness of space to the intricacies of DNA, it's amazing what we've uncovered so far. Right. It's like every time we think we have a handle on things, nature throws us a curveball. Speaking of curveballs, let's dig into geology for a bit. Those majestic layers of rock we see in places like the Grand Canyon, they're not just pretty to look at. They're like a history book of the Earth, right? Each layer representing millions of years of sedimentation. Exactly. Geologists call this the stratigraphic record, and it's a cornerstone of the deep time concept. Deep time being the idea that the Earth is billions of years old. But here's the thing that's always bugged me. If these layers really did form over millions of years, wouldn't we expect to see more erosion between them? You'd think so. Wind, rain, those exposed surfaces would have been sculpted over time, right? Sometimes we do see that. Those are called unconformities. Right. Unconformities, those gaps where erosion has eaten away at the rock record. But here's the catch. We often find layers that are supposedly separated by millions of years, yet they show remarkably little erosion. These are called paraconformities or flat gaps. Flat gaps. So it's like geological time took a coffee break, deposition stopped, erosion chilled out, and then millions of years later, boom, new layer on top. It does make you wonder. The standard explanation is that sedimentation simply paused, allowing time for erosion, but leaving minimal evidence. 
Okay, so maybe those missing layers just wrote it away really cleanly, leaving no trace. But something tells me it's not always that simple. You're right to be skeptical. Especially when you see these flat gaps over and over again in the geological column, it's a pattern that some geologists find difficult to reconcile with the vast stretches of time involved. So maybe those layers formed more quickly than we think. Maybe those millions of years were actually much shorter periods. It's a possibility worth considering. And it's not just the flat gaps that raise questions. What about folded rock strata? You mean like those mesmerizing bends and curves you see in rock formations? It always looks like someone took a giant iron to the Earth's crust. Exactly. And to achieve those kinds of folds, the sediments would have had to be soft and pliable, almost like dough. Which makes sense, because if those layers were already hardened into solid rock over millions of years, they would have just shattered under that kind of pressure, right? Precisely. To get those smooth, continuous folds, the entire sequence of layers likely had to be deposited relatively quickly while the sediments were still soft. So we're talking about forces powerful enough to fold rock layers like they're nothing. And we're talking about these layers forming much more rapidly than conventional geology might suggest. It makes you wonder about the kinds of events that could have shaped our planet in the past. It certainly challenges the uniformitarian view of Earth's history. Uniformitarianism, that's the idea that the slow, gradual processes we see today are the same ones that have always shaped the Earth. Right. right. It's often summarized as the present is the key to the past. But as we've seen, the rock record often tells a different story. A story of rapid change, of immense forces at work, forces that might make those slow and gradual processes seem a bit insignificant in comparison. And that brings us to another challenging area, radiometric dating. That's how scientists determine the age of rocks and fossils, right? By oh. measuring the decay rates of radioactive isotopes. Exactly. Yeah. But what many people don't realize is that radiometric dating relies on several assumptions. Assumptions about the initial conditions of the sample, about the decay rates remaining constant, and about the system remaining closed, meaning no contamination or leaching of isotopes over time. And are those assumptions always watertight? That's the million dollar question. There's a growing body of evidence that these assumptions might not always hold true, especially when dealing with very old samples. Take carbon-14 dating, for example. Carbon-14, that's the one with a relatively short half-life, right? Used to date things that are thousands of years old, not millions. Exactly. But here's the thing. Scientists have found carbon-14 in things like coal and diamonds, which are supposedly millions, even billions of years old. Hold on. If those ages are correct, shouldn't that carbon-14 have completely decayed by now? That's the paradox. If those samples are truly as old as claimed, there should be a single atom of carbon-14 left. Yet there it is. So either our understanding of carbon-14 decay is flawed, or those samples are much younger than we think. Either way, it seems like something's not adding up. It's a puzzle with potentially profound implications. And it ties back into that moving the goalposts idea. Because if the dating methods we rely on to establish the evolutionary timeline are being called into question, it undermines the very foundation of that timeline. Exactly. Okay. And it raises the question, are we truly following the evidence wherever it leads? Or are we so committed to the prevailing paradigm that we're willing to overlook or explain away anything that doesn't fit? It's a question worth pondering. And speaking of pondering, I think it's time we take a closer look at this moving the goalposts argument and explore its philosophical implications. But we'll save that for after the break. Stay with us. So we've unearthed some really interesting anomalies, haven't we? From the smoothness of the cosmic microwave background radiation to the surprises hidden in the geological record. It seems like the more we learn about the universe and our place in it, the more questions we uncover. Right. And that brings us to the heart of this moving the goalposts idea. This notion that sometimes when faced with data that doesn't fit the response is to, well, kind of move the goalposts. To change the explanation or introduce new concepts to preserve the existing framework. Exactly. Like saying, okay, that observation doesn't fit our current understanding, but instead of questioning the foundation, let's just add another layer on top. Precisely. And the article argues that this happens not just in one specific field. But across multiple disciplines where evolutionary theory is applied. Leading to a sense that maybe the goalposts are always shifting, making it difficult to have a genuine debate. So can you give us some concrete examples of this goalpost moving in action? Sure. Let's take the origin of the universe, for example. Mm -hmm. Before the Big Bang theory became the dominant model, 
the idea of an eternal universe was quite popular. Right, because if the universe was always there, you didn't have to explain where it came from. Exactly. But then came the evidence for the Big Bang, like the cosmic microwave background radiation we discussed earlier. Which strongly suggested that the universe had a beginning. And that created a problem for the eternal universe view. If the universe had a beginning, what came before? What caused it to begin? So how did proponents of the eternal universe idea respond to this new evidence? Well, some of them proposed the multiverse hypothesis. The multiverse. So ba basically saying, okay, our universe might have had a beginning, but maybe it came from another universe and that universe came from another universe and so on. That's the gist of it. Yeah. But, but of course, there's no direct observational evidence for the multiverse. Right. It's still a very speculative idea. And that's part of what this article is getting at. When faced with evidence that challenges the existing paradigm, sometimes the response is to introduce increasingly complex and untestable explanations. Instead of reconsidering the fundamental assumptions. It's like building a taller and taller tower on a foundation that might be shaky to begin with. And this isn't just happening in cosmology, is it? The article points out similar shifts within evolutionary theory itself. Absolutely. Think back to Darwin's original theory, which relied heavily on gradualism. The idea that evolution happens slowly and gradually over vast stretches of time. But then we have things like the Cambrian explosion. Right, where we see a sudden burst of new life forms appearing in the fossil record. And that doesn't quite fit with the slow and steady pace of gradualism, does it? It does make you wonder if those vast stretches of time were actually as vast as we thought. Exactly. And then there's the whole issue of soft tissue being found in dinosaur fossils, which seems to contradict the idea that those fossils are tens of millions of years old. These findings challenge some of the fundamental assumptions about the age and history of life on Earth. So how do we reconcile these challenges with the prevailing view of evolution? That's the million dollar question, and there's no easy answer. Some argue that these challenges can be explained away with further research and more refined explanations. While others see them as evidence that a more fundamental rethink of evolutionary theory might be necessary. And that's the beauty of scientific inquiry, isn't it? It's an ongoing process of discovery, debate, and refinement. We should never be afraid to question our assumptions, to follow the evidence wherever it leads, and to be open to the possibility that our current understanding might be incomplete. Absolutely. And that's something for all of us to keep in mind, whether we're talking about evolution, cosmology, or any other area of science. It's about cultivating a healthy skepticism a willingness to engage with different viewpoints, and a commitment to seeking truth wherever it may be found. Because ultimately, it's the pursuit of truth that drives scientific progress. And that's what makes it such an exciting and constantly evolving field. So to our listeners, we encourage you to keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep an open mind. Because the more we learn, the more we realize how much we still don't know. Man, that's a journey worth taking. Absolutely. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. We hope you enjoyed exploring these fascinating and thought-provoking ideas with us. Until next time, keep those brains buzzing. In the hands of the potter, where the clay is soft and new, a vessel takes its shape with every turn and view, each crease and every line molded by his grace though the process may be painful he's forming something great on the potter's wheel we are spinning round and round and round through the fire and the pressure until we're heaven bound every crack and every flaw he'll mend with tender care for the potter's hands are faithful and his love is always there Sometimes the vessel falters, crumbling in his hands But the potter never gives up, he has a perfect plan He reshapes the broken pieces, with patience and with skill And what was once discarded, now reflects his perfect will On the potter's wheel, we're spinning round and round and round Through the fire and the pressure, until we're heaven bound He'll mend with tender care For the potter's hands are faithful And his love is always there When you feel like you're shattered And your strength is wearing thin Remember you're in the hands Of the one who'll shape you from within He'll refine you in the furnace He'll mold you through the strife And when the work is finished You'll be a vessel full of life we were spinning round and round and round Through the fire and the pressure until
Trust the hardest process, even when it feels too tough.